It's the solemnity of the Annunciation of the Lord 2017 here on the University of Mary campus and we've been honored to have with us for the past couple of days Mr. George Weigel, the premier biographer of Pope St. John Paul II. George, thanks for being here and I'm just interested in hearing some of your impressions of your visit to our campus thus far. Well, it's been great to be here, Monsignor, and I thank you and your staff uh, for inviting me and your students for welcoming me so uh, handsomely. Uh, I've watched the growth of this school for the past several years with great interest and I really believe that you are creating here a model for what Catholic higher education in the future in the United States should be. Uh, that future is one of formation as well as education mm -hmm. so that uh, the whole young man or young woman uh, is addressed by their four or how many years here at the University of Mary. I think the fact that uh, you offer these students a rich liturgical life mm -hmm. uh, is very important. An opportunity for vocational discernment, thinking mm -hmm. through, pondering, wrestling. Uh, also important. And then there's the natural beauty uh, of the surrounding. This is a, a interesting part of the United States with a <coughs> somewhat turbulent history, mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, uh, this oasis of uh, Christian fidelity and peace uh, is, is a fine place to spend some time when you're a young person thinking through what it is you ought to do with your life. George, you've you commented, commented in the past on the great legacy of Catholic higher education in this country. It is the case that the United States has more Catholic colleges and universities than any other place. It's been a big project here. At the same time, uh, there's been a dissipation over the course of the last 40 or so years. I'm, I'm wondering if you might comment on some of the causes of that and then maybe the ingredients for renewal. During your time among us, you've talked about a new great awakening and the role of Catholic higher education in that, and I'm interested in hearing some of your thoughts along those lines. Well, we can take that in pieces. Um, what's happened over the past several generations, I think, really begins in the mid-1950s, when Monsignor John Tracy Ellis, longtime teacher of church history at Catholic University <clears throat> published an article called Catholic Intellectual Life Today, which was a rather brutal uh, critique of mm -hmm. the state of Catholic higher education in the United States. I think that critique was misread by many people. Uh, I do not believe Monsignor Ellis, whom I knew in the last years of his life, uh, was calling uh, for Catholic higher education to imitate what was going on in Harvard, Yale, mm -hmm. uh, Columbia, etc. I think he was, he was calling Catholic higher education to play to its strengths, which are classic liberal arts education, mm -hmm. the formation of the whole person, and the, the active meeting of faith and reason at a time when uh, in American higher education as a whole, uh, the idea of reason was becoming increasingly instrumental and pragmatic mm -hmm. and the idea of faith was simply dropping out of the picture. Uh, there's a famous joke we have in the first things world, the surround of the journal first things about the changes in Harvard's coat of arms. Right. It used to say veritas in Christo et ecclesia. Right truth in Christ and the church. Then it went to veritas. Christ and the church dropped out. Mm -hmm. And the joke was that they were just simply going to put a question mark right. after veritas <laughs> in the next iteration of this. That is certainly not what, what John Tracy Ellis had in mind. But beginning in, I think it was 1967, so 50 years ago, the Land O'Lakes mm -hmm. uh, statement. Was that 66 or 67? Right. Somewhere in there. Uh, a group of high-bouncing Catholic higher education people led by Father Ted Hesburgh from Notre Dame essentially declared the Catholic uh, college and university's independence from the institutional church in the name of uh, a kind of autonomy 
that they imagine would allow them to play in the big leagues, mm -hmm. to be Princeton, Harvard, Duke, Stanford, whatever. There was an important point there. Catholic colleges and universities needed to dial it up several notches yeah. in terms of academic excellence. But the implication that there was a tension between intellectual seriousness of a high caliber and Catholic fidelity was false. And Land O'Lakes and what came out of that right. in the transformation of Catholic higher education was based on that false premise, or at least lived that out. Moreover, here are these people saying at this nice resort in Wisconsin, let's be like Harvard, Berkeley, uh, Stanford, Cornell. At exactly the time Harvard, Stanford, Berkeley, Cornell were literally losing their minds. Mm -hmm. We're going crazy uh, in the radicalism of the 60s, followed by the postmodernism of there's your truth and my truth, but nothing called the truth. Um, following that path has led some Catholic institutions of higher education, some traditionally Catholic institutions of higher education, so far astray that, in my view, they simply can't be considered. Hmm. Catholic in anything but the most vestigial sense. Um, others, by contrast, have discovered the truth that John Paul II taught in um, uh, his Apostolic Constitution on Catholic higher education, Ex Corde Ecclesiae. The university comes out of the heart of the church. The Catholic Church invented the university right. in the high Middle Ages. I mean, those were the days you could choose between Bonaventure and Thomas Aquinas mm -hmm, in Paris right. for your uh, theology professor. Um, we, kn <coughs> we know how to do this. Um, and we can do it in a way that touches all of the dimensions of the human person, not just the pragmatic, the utilitarian, et cetera. So uh, the mission of Catholic higher education in the future in the U.S. Mm -hmm. is nothing less than to rescue the notion of the university, which has now become shrunken, diminished, very career-oriented. Right. Uh, I think of Cardinal George at, at Georgetown talking about the danger of becoming high-tech technical training schools. And, and he said, I mean that not as an insult. There's a place for that. But that's not the idea of a university in terms of the integration of knowledge. I think if Cardinal George was right about just about everything, and that was <laughs> uh, one of the things he was right about. Um, I find this disturbingly widespread, uh, this notion that you've got to do what we used to call in the 50s the high price spread, that right. ad for whatever margarine that <laughs> was. Uh, that your kid has to do the high price spread in order to make it in 21st century America. I mean, I was speaking at two very high-end Catholic prep schools, uh, one in the Midwest, one in the Northeast, about a year ago. And the parents were insisting that if the kid did not go to Duke or Stanford or whatever, uh, they were uh, way behind in their career development. And I said, I'm sorry, that's simply not true. Uh, my two daughters went to the University of Dallas, right. which I still think has the most demanding undergraduate curriculum in the United States. Not Chicago, not mm -hmm. a, Dallas is the most demanding. Uh, they both got a terrific undergraduate education. My older daughter waltzed into Johns Hopkins Medical School. Mm -hmm. And my younger daughter went to New York University for a master's degree in arts education and is now the education coordinator at a major arts center. In Don't you think the genes were involved in their no, brilliance I, too? Well, their mother's genes were. Oh, okay. uh, <laughs> but no, I can point to a lot of kids in their classes who sure. are doing solid classical liberal arts education. Right. With moral investment. Which in moral the investment and formation, which which gives you the sense of yourself as the legate of a civilization. Mm -hmm. You know? Th this prepares you for anything. 
Yeah. And you can go do nuclear physics after that, yeah. or civil engineering, or whatever. But first become a mature human being. Mm. And as long as Catholic higher education offers young people perhaps not the whole of their curriculum in the liberal arts, but a solid core that is carefully thought out, laid out, and required. Right. Uh, then it will be doing a great service, not only to business and the professions, but to the church uh, uh, and the culture. I did, <laughs> at one of these uh, prep schools, which is run by a community of monks, I met with the monks the next day, coffee in the sure. common room. And they said, this is a big problem, this thing you talked about last night. How do we get these parents to understand this? I said, well, here's a dramatic idea. You buy the parents of every incoming senior a paperback edition of Tom Wolfe's I Am Charlotte Simmons. Oh which is a novel about the corruption of a young woman mm -hmm. going to a high-end school from a simple right. background. And what's critically important, the book is very raw, but it's also true uh, in terms of its depiction of the mode of life on many right. campuses. And I said, what you have to point out to these parents is that it's the intellectual corruption that precedes the moral corruption. Right. This girl goes into a philosophy class where she's taught that there is no such thing as the truth, and that's what softens her up to get hit on by the basketball guy or the right. lacrosse guy or whatever the heck he was. This is extremely important yeah. because I, I think oftentimes we mistake because the the errors, the wounds of our time have such a have such moral import, we mistake them for primarily moral wounds instead of intellectual wounds. Yeah. And so the role of a university of course is to address some of the intellectual wounds in that sense. And so uh, that that those stand as you say as you're as as you're implying they stand at the base of much of the chaos. Now, you can go to the high price spread schools and get a reasonable education mm -hmm. and come out a serious Catholic. I happen to know, as a former student, a remarkable young woman named Aurora Griffin who graduated yeah, she from just wrote a book. Harvard, how to, how to Go to Harvard and Stay Catholic. Right. Um, good book to give to parents and kids, because it's not just about Harvard, it's really about any place. But Aurora went to Harvard as a well-formed yeah. uh, young woman. Um, and she knew how to uh, maneuver, particularly in the lifestyle world, mm -hmm. of decadence. And the, the basic maneuver is to get out of it. I mean, to right. find some... Uh, community. I think Opus Dei runs, for example, houses for both men and women, mm -hmm. undergraduates at Harvard. Okay, so you can do that and you can do the Harvard thing as well. Um, but the odds are better on the young man or woman getting a serious integral Catholic education at a place like this, or Dallas, or Benedictine down in mm -hmm. Atchison, Kansas, or Christendom, or wherever, or at a big state university with a vibrant Catholic campus ministry. Sure. I mean, I look at what the present Bishop of Tulsa, uh, Bishop David Conderla, uh, helped build when he was the chaplain at Texas A&M. Right. Uh, I mean, if you, if you ask, you're the man from Mars and you ask yourself, <coughs> where's the most dynamic Catholic campus ministry in the United States? Texas A&M is not where you would start looking. And yet it is. Right. I mean, there are 10,000 Catholic students on that campus, and three great chaplains in a row, all of whom trained at your alma mater, the North sure. American College. And lots of vocations. Have, have produced a vocation factory, mm -hmm. uh, both men and women, some great marriages, uh, a vibrant uh, university parish that itself is a great Catholic witness in the middle of the Bible Belt. Right. What do you discern as a blueprint that, that sort of runs through 
these different institutions that we're talking about. In other words, what are the ingredients for authentic renewal or for putting together an ethos in which students yeah. can, can flourish intellectually, morally, spiritually, et cetera? Well, I think you have to begin with, with uh, John Paul II. That's a great and, idea. And <laughs> uh, his letter to the Preparatory Commission for the Second Vatican Council when he said that the, the Western humanistic project has gone off the rails in the past 300 years. And the result of that, the decline, the replacement of metaphysics at the center mm -hmm. of intellectual life, uh, natural science is the only paradigm of knowledge. The only yeah. thing you can know is through the experimental method mm -hmm. or tautologies in, in math, uh, et cetera. Um, theology regarded as a subset of mythology. Uh, and all of this has resulted over three centuries in a terribly diminished view of the human person. So the first thing you have to recognize to begin this process of renewal is that the high price spread schools are wrong. That, that they're about fundamental. Anthropology. Th th they're wrong about anthropology, they're wrong about metaphysics, they're wrong about the epistemology, right. the nature of knowledge. They're wrong. Hmm. Th they've simply gotten it wrong. And their refusal to even engage in argument about maybe something has gone wrong here is a, is a sign of their intellectual decay. But they're places of diversity. They're places of the free exchange of ideas. But they're not, because the diversity does not extend to Orthodox Christians. Hmm. The diversity does not extend to people who believe that Adam and Eve can get married, hmm. but Adam and Steve getting married is just a false idea, which will make for human unhappiness. Uh, we see what we see what happened to Charles Murray at Middlebury College mm -hmm. a couple of weeks ago. I mean, violent protests against one of perhaps the three leading social scientists in the United States, explaining why some people aren't making it in America and what we can do about that to help. I mean, this is barbarism. Uh, uh, this is barbarism. Uh, and this is, is what John Courtney Murray called 60 years ago the barbarian in a Brooks Brothers suit. Oh, wow. Although, in this case, it's a barbarian in Birkenstocks and an Under Armour t-shirt. Uh, the Brooks Brothers suit went a long time ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but it's still barbarism. And uh, I don't see how serious intellectual life, much less serious human formation, can go on in an atmosphere in which ill-educated 19-year-olds are allowed to run riot, literally. I mean, this, this just doesn't work. And that parents are willing to pay sixty to $75,000 for this a year is, is simply insane. But the source of the running riot oftentimes comes from the ethos of the place where they're at. H how 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 did we come to a point of this lack of self-reflectiveness where where diversity is a, a watchword, but it's not extended to all ideas. And how can we, uh, in Catholic higher education, be attentive or vigilant about protecting ourselves from that type of infectious contradiction? Um, the latter is, is, I think, a bit simpler and shorter to mm -hmm. answer. Uh, Ex Corte Ecclesiae is one of the really great teaching documents and a pontificate of, of great right. teaching documents from John Paul II. And I think the, the institution that, in which faculty, staff, administration, and, and, and students uh, read that, talk about it together, ask mm -hmm. how well they're living it, is off to a very, very good uh, start. Uh, the other thing, uh, that I think Catholic universities bring to this problem is the abandonment of the notion in loco parentis mm -hmm. by university administrations. Right. We, we're standing in the place of parents. The utter abandonment of that has created uh, a free fire zone of, of decadence of all sorts. You know, you have these 
campuses where kids are paying sixty-five to seventy-five thousand dollars a year, have huge drinking problems, mm -hmm. huge uh, problems of, of uh, abusive sexual behavior, and all the rest. You cannot put volatile young people together without any supervision in a cultural uh, environment that says if it's if it itches, scratch it. Mm -hmm and expect something other than this. What Catholic universities offer is not so much in loco parentis, but in loco Christi, hmm. in the place of Christ. Uh, we are here in, in persona Christi, in the broadest sense, uh, to help you form the full human person, soul and heart as well as mind. Uh, and that's got to be part of the package. Right. And that means mode of life on campus. I mean, one of the reasons I would say, to take an example where I live, there is no way that Georgetown University can be considered a Catholic institution in anything but a vestigial sense. Not only has to do with what goes on in the theology department, or the ratio of, of Catholics to non-Catholics on the faculty, it primarily has to do with mode of life on campus. I mean, Georgetown has one of the biggest historic binge drinking problems of any top-tier university in the country. There's a reason for that. So Cardinal Newman, when he was founding the Catholic University of Ireland, talked about the university and the collegiate principle and how those two things need to go together. Of course, that forms a base for right. our Catholic Studies project here. Right. I wonder if you could say a word about the importance of Catholic Studies in terms of the integration of a, of a university community. Well, one, one, of the, one of the pieces of good news over the past 20 years has been the development of what initially seemed paradoxical. What are we doing with a Catholic studies program at a Catholic mm -hmm. university? Why isn't the whole university a Catholic studies program? Well, okay, insofar as, as many Catholic universities have become multiversities, mm -hmm. you need some reactor core of integral Catholicism within the curriculum and the program of human formation. And that's what Catholic Studies intends to do. Form the Catholic mind, form the Catholic spirit, form the Catholic heart, because service is very much a part of all this. It's not just brain candy and, yeah. and uh, soul candy. Right. It, it's getting out there and getting your hands dirty. Um, and this, I think this is also the model, that Catholic Studies model, which your colleague Don Briel has done more to develop than anyone, I think has now, has now begun to have a serious effect in campus ministry on state university campuses. Right, our project at Arizona State Your university. project at Arizona State, uh, what's going on down the road uh, in Nebraska, both at, uh, in Lincoln and in Omaha. Mm -hmm. uh, these are uh, Catholic centers right. in the full sense, uh, residential, Mm -hmm. formation, liturgical, spiritual direction. And when you have a state university administration and a legislature that hasn't lost its mind, mm -hmm. as those in my part of the world <laughs> have, you can then begin to offer academic programs out of these places that a sensible university president will, will recognize, amplifies uh, the program that, that, that he or she is responsible for. So you get courses and right. Augustine, Aquinas, right. whatever, uh, out of these campus ministries that are accredited, and and kids can you know make this part of their make this part of their degree program. For instance, down at Arizona State, Michael Crow, who's the president of ASU, right. when we read his strategic plan and when we heard him talking about what it would take to form the new American University, we asked whether he really meant it and the hospitality that he's offered to us. ASU has opened wide its doors, and he said publicly, he said that, that the presence of the University of Mary on our campus doing Catholic studies and theological studies is really important because they're offering things and intentional community that we're not able to offer. That type of open-minded yeah, yeah. clarity is very rare. It, it is rare, and it's unfortunately rare, and it's rare in part because of 60 years of 
fouled up jurisprudence on the Supreme Court about mm. the First Amendment and the nature of what, what it says, what it what it says about uh, no establishment of religion, which is my dear friend, the late Father Richard John Newhouse said, mm. only makes sense in terms of the free exercise of religion. Right. Why, why do you have no establishment? So you have free exercise. Uh, and I think ASU has figured this out and the Arizona legislature hasn't gotten in the way. Mm. That would be very hard to do in the state of Maryland right now, for sure. example, though there's, there's no reason not to at least uh, try. Uh, I think the other challenge that that I know you're trying to address with ASU uh, is the economic challenge. Yeah. Th this is, uh, there, are, there is a real danger that Catholic universities, Catholic colleges are pricing themselves out of the market, mm -hmm. uh, particularly as the demographics of, of Catholicism in the United States change. Um, this next wave of, of immigrant families, right. largely from Spanish speaking, uh, countries is is not going to be able to um, afford uh, what was affordable when I was a kid or you were a kid because uh, we're for third fourth fifth generation people um, so that that's going to have to be addressed somehow I'm not sure what the answer to that is um, but uh, it's terribly important to um, grow uh, the Catholic University world in the United States in depth as well as width. Mm -hmm. um, the growth can't simply be lateral. We've got more stuff, we've got more programs, we right. offer more degrees. It has to be growth in depth if the Catholic University is going to be part of the new evangelization and is going to equip these young people to be missionary disciples mm -hmm. who are countercultural for the sake of converting the culture. Right. One of the problems with the aftermath of Land O'Lakes in terms of trading in one's identity or one's mission for prestige is that then all of a sudden you need to bolster or marshal all of these resources to do very expensive things, tuition shoots up and you're no longer serving immigrant populations. And, and so when we think about, for instance, our project at Arizona State University, we realize that we're poised to serve first generation low income students uh, who are coming to this country and who in many ways are the future of the church here. Yeah. And so that's really important. Yeah, I mean, I, this, is, this is one of the serious corruptions of American higher education. Um, 20 years ago, I don't know what it is today, but 20 years ago, I, I believe this number is accurate, Stanford University had 120 full-time fundraisers. Mm. Harvard today has a endowment, I believe, over $40 billion. That is tax-free money. Why is Harvard not required to offer free tuition? Why, why is Harvard allowed to charge tuition under those circumstances? I mean, we don't tax certain things mm -hmm. because we think they, they, they fulfill a public function. Right. I've lived my whole professional life in the nonprofit world. I'm all for nonprofit uh, don donation, full deductibility. But when people give to the Ethics and Public Policy Center, we're not squirreling it away. Yeah. We're, we're we using it for we don't public do that good. Either, right? Yeah, but at Harvard, they do. Mm -hmm. And why that is, that is really, I, I think it's bad public policy. Uh, it's bad educational policy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's ultimately corrupting. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, it turns the university into uh, a bank uh, yeah. of some sort or other. And you know, banks have their purposes, but universities aren't banks. Well, for the record, George, you're sitting on the campus of the most affordable Catholic university in America. There we go. And when our friend Cardinal Dolan was here, he said that the tuition here is the cost of a stake in two martinis in Manhattan. Well, given Cardinal Dolan's propensity for <laughs> steak and martinis, I hope that's not true. But, uh, <laughs> sure. You know, I, I wanted to, to talk just a little bit with you about Pope St. John Paul II. Sure. When I read through Ex Cordia Ecclesia, he has that very small line 
at the very beginning, which is always deeply moving to me because it's so packed with meaning, where he says, I myself was deeply influenced by time spent in university settings. Yeah. And I think of, of his time at the Angolonian University, his chaplaincy at St. Florian's, his professorship at Lublin. Um, talk, talk just a little bit about the influence of the university on the person of John Paul II. Well, it's a curious influence in that uh, as a young person, he had a bizarre university experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had only completed his freshman year at the Agalonian right. when uh, the Nazi invasion and occupation took place. The decapitation of Polish culture. That was the attempt. Now, the university reconstituted itself as an underground uh, university right. and he continued his undergraduate studies and in that way he had um, one year of normal seminary mm -hmm. uh, in 1945 1946 then he got into a more normal if the Roman university system can be considered normal. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> university uh, experience at the Angelicum uh, in Rome where he did his first uh, doctorate. Um, but it's, it's when he comes back to uh, Poland, does the second doctorate, the so-called habilitation, which is basically a matter of writing another dissertation, uh, and at, at the Agalonian where he was the last habilitation thesis in theology to be accepted before the communists shut down the theology department. Mm. Uh, it's when he goes to Lublin, which was this remarkable little place, uh, a couple of hours east of Krakow, the only Catholic university in the entire communist right. world. That's right. Or where his, his uh, friend, colleague, Professor Stefan Sijowski, uh said to me, uh, our department was the only place between East Berlin and Seoul South Korea, mm -hmm. where philosophy was free. So this is a university on the edge here, right. in a very distinctive way. And he loved it. Um, he never lived there. He was a commuter professor. But he loved it, and it had an enormous impact on him, as, of course, did his chaplaincy work with students um, in Krakow between the first and second. Uh, doctorates and a whole lot of stuff that has changed the face of the Catholic Church throughout the world grows out of all that. Right. Love and responsibility begins at Lublin. Theology of the body begins at Lublin. Right. Uh, world Youth Day begins at the parish of St. Florian's, which was the base of his campus ministry. Mm. Uh, three years ago, when my son and I were in Krakow, uh, he to do the photography for the book City of Saints, uh, which introduces you to Krakow through the life of John Paul II. We went to the 50th wedding anniversary celebration of two of John Paul II's old kids wow. from those St. Florian days. And at the end of the Mass in Wawel Cathedral, uh, they're gathered there with all of their friends. And I said, from those days, uh, and I said to my son, Stephen, I said, you see those people? That's the beginning of World Youth Day. Mm -hmm. World Youth Day starts with these people. Because when he came to the papacy, and ev virtually every other bishop in the world said, youth ministry is hopeless, these kids mm -hmm. are living on another planet. Uh, he said, no, actually, the music may be different, but they're the same people as, as what I was working with uh, back then. Uh, and we now see uh, the results of that and the fruits of that. Um, so it's, uh, it's always very uh, moving for me to be with those people, some of whom have become very close friends of mine. When uh, World Youth Day was in Krakow last summer, mm -hmm. I uh, arranged an evening where some of JP2's old kids wow. could meet with a half dozen American bishops uh, including our friend uh, Cardinal Dolan. Uh, and it was just a marvelous uh, evening. Uh, everybody was deeply <laughs> impressed with everybody else. The bishops were like this. <laughs> right. I mean, th these are these people. Th this is the dining room table where he would celebrate right. Mass occasionally. 
I mean, their their eyes are like, uh, like this. And one of one of the old Wojtyla kids, who's now a very distinguished high energy particle physicist, said to me the next day, "Can we trade bishops? <laughs> We'd like to have yours." <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about that in this very same strain of thought. What did Denver 93 mean to this country? I was just in, in Denver. I'm on the yeah, board yeah. of the seminary down there. I, I had some time with Cardinal Stafford. We talked. Yeah. I, I was a newly graduated uh, college freshman in mm. 1993. And I remember going to World Youth Day. And it was that sense of not being alone that you write about in uh, Letters yeah. to a Young Catholic. What did, what did John Paul II's courage and vision in coming to Denver instead of maybe to a place nearer to your hometown. What did that mean? Well, the alternatives were Chicago and Buffalo because the Bishops' Conference in those days uh, simply didn't think this would, was possible. Mm -hmm. So one option was to do it in Buffalo because that was near Canada so you could cover the debt yeah. by Canadian kids. Um, then there was Chicago. Uh, and then, then Archbishop Stafford said, no, I want this in Denver. Right. And he stepped up and he sold John Paul II on the idea of doing this, going straight into the heart of secular city and right. saying, all right, I'll see you and raise you here. Um, it, it certainly turned around the Archdiocese of Denver. Uh, Denver is one of the great new evangelization dioceses in the country today. And it's full of young people who are very talented and giving their lives to the service of the church. It's the birthplace of focus. The birthplace of focus, the St. Augustine Institute, the mm -hmm. seminary, I mean, go through the list. That all starts in 93. Um, I think it sent an enormous signal to the bishops of the United States. Wait a minute, you know, you, th th you can do this. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was, that was very important. It, I was not there, but it was astonishing. I talked to the guy who flew the helicopter with the Pope into the old Mile High Stadium. Right. And he told me that he had not experienced air turbulence like that. Since Vietnam. Since Vietnam. Right. Uh, when he was getting shot at because of the, just the noise from One of the voices was these, me and my brother. Kids. Well, <laughs> yeah. you guys can make a lot of noise, I'm, I'm sure. Um, and the Pope loved it. Uh, the last, this, will, this little vignette will be in uh, my book, Lessons in Hope, My Unexpected Life right. with St. John Paul II. Um, our last pre-Christmas dinner together in December 2004, I had brought him this big picture book of national parks of the United States. Oh, yeah. Because he, he had a thing about picture books. I mean, got the poet's mind. Right. You know? So he opens it at the table, and he goes very laboriously, because he was in somewhat tough shape in those days, finds Rocky Mountain National Park yeah. in the table of contents and opens it. Mm. Rocky Mountain National Park, World Youth Day 93. Mm. Bishop said it couldn't be done. Mm. <laughs> I proved them wrong. <laughs> So he still had some game at the right. uh, at the end, and he loved rubbing their noses in it. I mean, you guys said I couldn't do it, and I jolly well uh, did it. I think it was an enormous uh, gift to the church in the U.S. Um, and I don't know. I mean, there have been a couple of World Youth Days that had, you, you can point to really enduring impact. I think Paris 97 did yeah. make a big difference uh, in starting a lot of renewal movement activity. Um, uh, Chestahova uh, in 92, is that right? Is that right, Chestahova in 92? So. Uh, was the first time you had kids from both sides of the wall. Mm -hmm. together, and that may have had some uh, impact. But I think in, in terms of measurable, enduring, continuing impact on a local church, it, it's hard to be Denver 93. That was really, right. that was really putting the cables on the battery and, and charging it up. Cardinal Stafford told me that um, they didn't even reserve Mile High Stadium until about five months out because they were convinced 
the, the American bishops thought maybe 50,000 yeah, would come at max. Yeah, yeah. But of course it was millions. It was an amazing the thing. Other, the other amazing thing, I think this is in witness to hope, the police chief of Denver said there was not one felony committed in Denver during the entire time the Pope was there. Amazing. I mean, the, the atmosphere that was created was so astonishing. There wasn't mm -hmm. a single serious crime in the city, which had been appar apparently, I think I have this in there, in something of a serious crime wave, and it just stopped. Right. You know, I, I, um, I'm going to ask somewhat of a rambling question, but it's, it's one that brings us, I think, to the end of our time together. Y your friendship to the University of Marion coming and visiting mm -hmm. with us is really deep. World Youth Day in Denver was about friendship. In fact, I met people there whom I'm still friends sure. with today. John Paul II was a genius at friendship, and you noted that in, in talking with some of the people that he had under his care when he was a chaplain at St. Florian's. Uh, some of his students at, at Lublin, uh, this kind of thing. And George, in your life, uh, you've been deeply blessed by great friends. You mentioned Father Newhouse, uh, who was just, he was an extraordinary person. And his influence upon uh, the public life um, of this country, the, the, the work that First Things yeah. has done, it has just been amazing. John Sr. Uh, wrote once that the purpose of a university is not research, but friendship. And he said, mm. I, I say it softly. <laughs> I say it sweetly. It's not research, but it's friendship. And I always say to our professors here that our work is to uh, have a, com a communion of friends who are inviting students into, into that friendship, right. into that community. And so when we talk about the moral import of the intellectual pursuit uh, that a university is involved in, it's about friendship, and I wonder if you might offer some thoughts about friendship, because you've been a blessed person. Mm. You've been friends with John Paul II, Father Newhouse, so many other people, and in your friend, Cardinal Dolan, in your friends, certainly, you've drawn riches, and you've given, given those riches back to us through your work, through your speaking, through your writing. Talk to us about friendship and its importance in the life of a university and in the life of a, of a missionary disciple. Well. Let's begin with, with John Paul II. Um, uh, one of the most interesting things that was said to me when I was preparing Witness to Hope was said by this striking character, Sister Amelia Ehrlich, mm -hmm. whom I describe at some length in Lessons in Hope. She was his English tutor. She ran his private library in the Vatican. Uh, she was a biblical scholar of, of some considerable competence. Uh, but she said to me once when we were talking about him, that he said, she said there's a curious singularity in his life. Mm. Every time he's about to have a big spiritual experience, something bad happens. His mother dies right before he's going to make his first communion. His brother dies right before he's confirmed. Mm. He's discerning the priesthood. His father dies. Uh, he's about to be named a bishop, and his friend, Marian Yavorsky, is filling in for him at some function. He gets hit by a train and loses his arm. He's about to be elected pope, his best friend in Rome. Uh, then Archbishop André Descor uh, has a terrible stroke and is essentially rendered mute the rest of his life. Uh -huh. he, he's, and what she said, well, he, he was orphaned many times. Mm -hmm. And I think that, in part, there's two facets to that. One is that's the call to him to be ever more fully dependent on the Lord. But it's also a human reason why he cherished his friendship so much. Mm -hmm. uh, um, while always recognizing that his, his closest friend had to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. So you've got this image of him climbing through the, the Tatras in the south of Poland with these young people in the 50s and 60s. I mean, when he was the Cardinal Archbishop of Krakow. And you know, all day long, he'd be part of the gang and singing and joking and talking and whatnot. But they would tell me at the end of the day, he would drift back to the end of the line uh, to be by himself. Mm -hmm. with the closest friend, because that's, that was the hour that made all the other hours of his day possible. 
And I think there's a lesson in that for all of, uh, for all of us. Um, uh, so many human, natural human communities have been broken down by the acids of modernity. Very few of us grow up in extended families anymore. Uh, people are scattered all over uh, a very large country. Um, uh, the kids you grew up with you rarely see again. Uh, the people you went to high school and college with you rarely see again. Um, in, in that kind of a fractured environment, uh, Christian friendship, uh, which is a friendship of the soul and the heart as well as of, of the mind and the spirit, uh, is terribly important. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you say, I have been richly uh, blessed by friendships that that touched all of those dimensions of uh, our lives. Uh, my my closest friends tend to be the people I work with in in a variety of ways, um, academically, ecclesiastically, politically, and whatnot. And that's good because in this. Uh, air turbulence that we're experiencing all over the place right now. You know, that ongoing conversation, uh, what's going on, what should we be doing, how do we respond mm -hmm. to this, how can we, as Richard used to say, we're, how, we're going to turn this around. <laughs> how are we going to turn this around? Uh, that's, that's very important, um, both to maintaining morale uh, and to keeping your mind fresh. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very easy after a certain point to start repeating yourself, um, and you know, some repetition is necessary. Moderat studiorum. Well, uh, <laughs> that Bob, no, it was, it was Samuel Johnson. Mankind more often needs to be reminded than instructed. Right. Um, however, um, a little uh, openness to new insight uh, keeps the juices flowing. And, uh, and that's why I value my contact with, with university life around the country and indeed around the world. I cannot imagine living in an environment that didn't have a university in it. I mean, that would just be impossible for me. I mean, I need that kind of uh, surround and the kind of people you find in that sort of surround. And I'm very grateful that I've been able uh, to do that, even though I happily escaped formal academic life in 1977 and have not looked back since. <laughs> uh, but I'm glad to be a, a kissing cousin of uh, the Academy. I hope you feel refreshed and consoled to be here at the University of Mary. Uh, to be at the University of Mary for all, even for 24 hours after a week in Washington, D.C., is balm and water in the desert. Welcome to The Real America, George. Thank you. Good. Thanks very much. We're really pleased to be here again on our university's feast day, on the Feast of the Annunciation of the Lord, with George Weigel, a public intellectual, the biographer of John Paul II, and a friend of the University of Mary. George, thanks again for being with us. Thank you.